Well, deacons have uh, long been the um, brunt of jokes in Baptist life. You've heard that the reason why the preacher's kids are so bad is because they hang out with the deacon's kids. I know you've heard that one. I uh, Just personally, I uh, find it humorous that in my file cabinet, I still have a file cabinet, in my file cabinet, deacon ministry is followed by devil worship. I'm just saying that's, <laughs> that's just the truth. I'm just saying that's what it is. Well, sometimes deacons uh, deserve the reputation of hiring and firing the pastor, and sometimes they don't deserve that reputation. Sometimes they have the reputation of sitting in a board meeting and telling the pastor what he ought to do, and sometimes that's justified, and sometimes that accusation is not justified. But throughout the years of working with churches, my best friends have usually been deacons, and my biggest enemies have usually been deacons, not the same people. Deacons are the ones who have come to my office and told me you need to get out of here and Sunday would be the best time for you to do it, followed up by other deacons that have come in and said, no, I'll stand by you, let's fight, let's stay. In 33 years of full-time pastoring, five churches, I have experienced probably some of the best deacons and I have experienced maybe Some of the worst, I don't know. I've heard some horror stories from other pastors too. But in all that time, I've had more problems from myself than any other deacon. I've had more problems that I cause myself than any chairman of a committee, than the WMU director, or anybody else. If I could kick the person who caused me the most problem, I wouldn't be able to sit down for a week. It's not the deacons, it's not the committee members, it's usually me. My biggest adversary is not a person in this room other than myself. The biggest adversary I have is Satan attacking me daily. Christians within our church should be servants, we should be workers, and we should have a good servanthood model presented to us by our deacons and our ministers. A church cannot have serving deacons and prepared teachers and proclaiming ministers unless the church is a serving church, a working church, a preparing church, a proclaiming church. Deacons serve and the church should follow that example as the deacons do, good or bad. Now in 1 Timothy chapter 3, that's not our text, but if you want to refer to it, you can. We're we're going to be in Acts chapter 6. But in 1 Timothy chapter 3, there are two distinct positions or people spelt out in 1 Timothy 3. The first paragraph of 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7, is the overseer. And if you look at that passage, it talks about the overseer, and it gives the expectations of the overseer and so forth. And that word overseer may be translated different ways in your Bible. It can be translated office of bishop, a church leader, superintendent, supervisor. The Greek word is episcopus. We get from that Greek word, we get the name of the church, the Episcopal church. And what it means is a superintendent, a a leader. Now there's debate on whether or not that word could be referred to our modern day pastor or if that word might be used of a staff, a ministerial staff, or if that word might be used of a elder board. Some churches have an elder board that leads them. So there's some debate on what that term refers to, if it is a person or a group of people, but there is no debate on that. It is referring to the leadership of the church. It's someone who leads. The second paragraph in 1 Timothy chapter 3, which starts with verse 8 through 12, Though the qualifications are very similar to the overseer, and in fact, if you compare them, they're almost identical, they're quite different in their responsibility. The word deacon is in that second paragraph. It's used in uh, 1 Timothy 3, verse 8 and verse 12. It's translated deacon or servant of the church or a minister of the church, and that Greek word is diakonos, and it comes from the word that means to run an errand. It means to attend a table or a a waiter. It means to do menial jobs, menial tasks. 
the Greek lexicon that I use to help me understand Greek words from time to time, it, it defines this word as one who executes the commands of another, especially from the master. It's an attendant or a minister for another. It means one who by virtue of their office assigned by the church cares for the poor and is in charge of distributing the money given to help the poor. We're going to see that in a minute here in Acts 6 concerning the widows. It's the same word that's used in John 2, verse 5 and verse 9, when it says that, Je that Jesus had some servants get the water jugs, and he turned those into wine. He, talk he uses the word servant. It's the same word that's used. It's a word that's used more in a universal sense in Matthew 22, verse 13, as it talks about being servants of the king. So in that regard... We are all deacons in that regard. We're all to be servants of, of the king. And so a deacon can do other things. They can teach. They can lead. They can administer. They can organize. But their primary task is to serve. And so if they cannot serve or they're unwilling to serve, then they have missed the first qualification for being a deacon. Uh, that word serve or servant is used in a descriptive way also of the pastor, of the overseer, in a descriptive way. So you could say that you expect your pastor to serve and your, your ministers to serve in a descriptive way. With the deacons, it's not just a descriptive way. It's actually the name of what they do. They are servants in, in that regard. Well, Acts chapter 6 is believed to be in in. Almost all scholars believe this to be the case, to be the embryonic form of deacons, the very beginning of deacons. It's actually before deacons are a more formal setting in the First Timothy 3 passage. They're, they're more formal. It's, it's an obvious office by then. Here, in this case, it seems to be more of a task that they're doing, but Again, almost all scholars believe this is the starting of what a deacon is, and then it evolves by the time it gets to 1 Timothy in more of a formal setting. So I think it's good for us to go to Acts chapter 6, and uh, maybe we can't find total application for our local church from Acts 6, but I think we can definitely find some good points for us to understand on what a deacon ought to be. So here in a moment in our business session, uh, Terry Dumas, the chairman of our deacons, he's going to present to the church that we began the process of selecting some, some uh, new deacons, adding to our deacon body. So you need to know what to expect of deacons. You need to know what a deacon ought to be. And so let's just take it from this passage. And I found seven things from Acts chapter 6. Let's read Acts 6 starting with verse 1. It says this. In those days, as the disciples were increasing in number, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews, now that would be like the Greek-speaking Jews, against the Hebraic Jews, that would be the Hebrew-rooted Jews, that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. So here's a common problem. One group of people feel like they're being overlooked in the distribution of food, and the other group feels like they're, they're getting treated properly. Verse 2, the 12 summoned the whole company of the disciples and said, it would not be right for us to give up preaching the word of God to wait on tables. Brethren, and then as the Christian standards suggest that women would be included in that as well, brothers and sisters, select from among you, so they're coming from the congregation, select from among you seven men of good reputation, I wouldn't emphasize that it has to be seven. I don't believe that's the case. That was just the number that they needed at that, at that time. Seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Well, this proposal pleased the whole company. So all the disciples that were there, it pleased them. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and then it lists some others, and, and uh, we'll get to some of those later verses here in a minute. So let me show you seven things on what a deacon ought to be. Number one, they ought to be able to diminish conflict. 
Notice in verse 1, the first thing that brings about the need for these seven men is there's a conflict in the local congregation. There's a group of people who feel like we're being mistreated. We're, we're, they're, they were probably taking care of widows financially with food or whatever. One group of widows said we're being overlooked while the other group is being taken care of. And so it was just a practical issue that was stirring up the church. So deacons are to be able to squelch conflict, to diminish conflict, not stir conflict, but diminish conflict. It was either 02 or 03, I'm not for sure, back then at the church, the second best church I ever pastored. So y'all have moved from being equal to, to now you're number one. <laughs> second best church I ever pastored. I, at that time, I took Mondays off. I worked Friday. I worked Thursday through Friday and then Sunday. I took Mondays off. So Tuesday morning, I walk into my office, be my first day in the week, of the week there, and there is a, a note, a, a little letter folded, taped on my front door, which is never good. Uh, and I open it up, and it's one or two sentences from the music minister saying, I, I'm resigning immediately. His hall's right down the office from mine. I walk down. It's completely cleaned out. The keys are left on the desk. I called him immediately to no avail, called several times, called his wife a couple of times. Finally, about the second time, she answered and uh, told me her side and said that she would make sure that the man called me. It wasn't long after that the man called me and basically this is what he said. He said, I am going to the gay lifestyle. And that was it. He said, pray for me. I can't help it. This is what I am. It didn't help that I had been for a year in dialogue with him about his performance and about how poor it was and how his heart wasn't in it. And it didn't help that in the last three months I had pulled in some deacons and the chairman of the personnel committee into those conversations with him, not behind his back, but with him about his performance. That did not help. That was Tuesday. Tuesday night, we called a, a meeting with the deacons and the personnel committee, and we came up with our plan. Deacons were going to go to every group of people on Wednesday nights. They were going to go to the teachers of the children. They were going to go to the youth ministry. They were going to go to the adults. I was not going to say a word. They were going to present only what we knew and nothing else. They weren't going to speculate. They were going to only say what the information that they knew, and they were going to pray, and that's all we did. They said, Sunday, Pastor, we will have a deacon within earshot of you everywhere you go. There'll be no place on this building that you'll be that we will not have a deacon that will be able to hear anything that is said to you. And if anything is said that is accusatory towards you, we will step in and take care of it. Now, nobody did, but they were prepared. We did have two families in the church. One family was a, a deacon and his wife that blamed me. Don't ask me how in the world I could drive someone to gayness. I don't know how, how that's my fault. But two families thought it was my fault. And the chairman of the deacon, Donnie Hammonds, a young man in his early 30s, he had only been a deacon for a few years. Terry, you know how that goes. You're only a deacon for a few years and then make you chairman. That's the way it works in Baptist church. We're tired of doing it. Let's let somebody else do it. That's kind of what we did to Donnie. Donnie was a young man, but he's very wise. And he just came to me when he heard about these two families. And he said, Pastor, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. And they took care of it. I don't know what they did, but they took care of it. Never, had, never lost any other families. Never heard a negative word towards me about anything. They took care of it. Deacons should not be stirring division. They should be diminishing conflict. Number two, honor those who are, this is what a deacon ought to be, honor those who are responsible for proclaiming the word by freeing ministers to focus on the Bible and prayer. That does not mean that ministers can't use a shovel and can't get down on their hands and feet or hands and knees and do whatever needs to be done. But the best use of their time is normally in the preparation of God's Word and 
more of the spiritual end of things. And so the deacons free the, the minister up to do that. Number three, deacons ought to be known to be full of the Spirit. Now, I want you to look at verse 3. In verse 3, it says, uh, Brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation. In other words, they are renowned for their spirit. They are known for their spirit. They are respected for their spiritual life. When you think of the most spirit-filled people in the church, who do you think of? Now, that, that ought to be deacons. That's it's, it's what it ought to be. And so that's what the Scripture is telling us. Number four, uh, the deacon should be full of the spirit and godly wisdom. So it goes on in verse uh, three, and it says they should have this good reputation. And then it says what the reputation should be for. Full of the Spirit and wisdom. What does that look like practically to be full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom? Let me give you three things. You can just jot down these three things if you want to. First, I think of the fruit of the Spirit. When I think of someone who's full of the Spirit and full of wisdom, I think of the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Someone full of the Spirit is going to have the fruit of the Spirit. Another thing I think of is the Beatitudes. I mean, that's just kind of where my mind goes. I have no scriptural basis to show that. I just kind of think of the Beatitudes. You remember the, Be the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, such things as uh, to be poor in spirit. That means you understand your own brokenness. You understand that the biggest problem that you have is you, just like the biggest problem I have is me. That's being poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who know what ought to break their hearts, those who are meek, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, the merciful, the pure in heart, peacemakers, that's one of the things uh, in the Beatitudes, and those who are persecuted because of righteousness. So I think of the fruit of the Spirit, I think of the Beatitudes. And then the third thing I think of is if you're full of the Spirit, I think you want to do things that are, that are about the Spirit. In other words, I think you want to read the Bible and study the Bible with other believers. I think you want to worship God with other believers. I think you want to pray with other believers. I think you want to do, you, instead of running from spiritual things, you're running to spiritual things if you're full of the Spirit. So that's what I think of when I think of being full of the Spirit and of wisdom. And in verse 5, we see the name mentioned, Stephen. And of the seven names, he's the only one that has this lengthy of a description about him. And it's because in Luke, Luke is going to introduce how Stephen becomes the first martyr of the Christian, uh, of the Christian faith. And so it says in verse 5, it says that Stephen was a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Then it lists the others, but then it immediately goes to verse 8 and it starts talking about why Stephen was so full of the Holy Spirit. It goes all the way, look at chapter 7. Chapter 7 is Stephen preaching a sermon. It's a long chapter. I guess he was a long preacher. So, you know, and, and he preaches all the way up to uh, about verse 52, 53. He preaches his long sermon. Now, let's pick up the action. This is one of the first, the embryonic forms of deacons, uh, one who in, is an example of being full of the Spirit. Let's look at what happens to Stephen in chapter 7, verse 54. When they heard these things, now these things are his sermons, so I don't feel quite so bad when I preach a bad sermon, this has never happened to me, okay? When they, when they heard these things, they were enraged and gnashed their teeth at him. Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. He saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. He said, look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. They yelled at the top of their voices, covered their ears, and together rushed against him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the, witness, and the witnesses laid their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Now, you may be familiar that that ends up being Paul, who wrote 13 of our letters in the New Testament. So he ends up being converted. Verse 59, while they were stoning Stephen, he called up, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And listen to this. He knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord do not hold this sin against them. And after saying this, he died. I, I think that's a pretty good example of somebody full of the Spirit. 
I mean, he, as they are killing him, he's saying, God, don't hold it against them. Be merciful. Number five, what a deacon ought to be, is responsible. Back to chapter 6, verse 3, responsible. So the, the 12 gather the disciples, all, all the followers around, and they say, among you, choose someone of good reputation. And then the last part of verse 3, it says, and we will appoint them this duty. In other words, we're going to give them this responsibility. We're going to put them in charge. One translation reads, put them in charge. So they are leaders. They're able to organize themselves and lead themselves to accomplish ministry, to accomplish service and, and, uh, and, and help for the congregation. Also notice in verse 3, the last part, that the apostles turned it over to them. It became a particular ministry that they did, and it helped the conflict of the church so that everyone felt like their ministries were being taken care of. The deacons helped the church in that regards. So deacons are pace setters in ministry and service, not just setters, pace setters. Some of y'all get that about midnight tonight. Setters, like sitting, pace setters. All right, tough crowd. We're just going to move on. We're going to leave it alone. Don't worry about it, okay? One of the easiest things to do in a Baptist church is to say yes to a position and, and not do it. Say yes and either do it in a sloppy way or, or just not, not do it at all. With the same vigor that someone starts a ministry that it's recognized by the rest of the church, that person should be a deacon. With the same vigor, they should continue that act of service. You know, we're not the NFL that once you get your contract, you just slough off. That's not what we're supposed to be doing. The, the same level of intensity that identifies us as a deacon is the floor. It's not the ceiling. It's the floor for growth in service. Number six, uh, what a deacon ought to be, has an excellent knowledge of Scripture and I get this from Stephen, starting in, in chapter 6, verse 9. It goes all the way through that sermon in chapter 7. Uh, and I'm not saying that uh, deacons have to be Bible scholars. I'm not saying that they have to have seminary degrees or anything like that. But they need to read the Bible and know the Bible so that they can defend. I think basically what Stephen did is he argued for the deity of Jesus Christ as the only means of salvation. So you, you, you need to have that level of knowledge of, of the Bible. And number seven what deacons ought to be. Their ministry assists in church in, in the church growing. So in verse 7, Acts 6, verse 7, it says, so the word of God spread. So they they've got, had this little crisis in the church, had some people upset. They assigned these seven men to take care of this practical need. Now look what happens in verse 7. So the word of God spread. The disciples in Jerusalem increased greatly in number, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. So these servants affected growth in the church because instead of people getting mad and leaving, there was harmony in the church. And even today, people like harmony in a church. They don't like to go to church where people are fighting. So that's why deacons take care of things behind scenes and squatch things behind scenes is to keep harmony in the church. And then the, the, this harmony was so effective as they begin, as the disciples begin to share the gospel, and Stephen is one of them, and Philip is one of them, that, that they're sharing the gospel too, is that even the superficial Jewish leaders, the priests, some of them were converted. So, some of the most, you know, uh, hard-nosed uh, Jewish people, they were converted to Christianity too because of the harmony they saw in the church and because of the witness that was presented. So deacons are the tissue that holds the body of the church together. They hold the head up straight. They support the backbone of the church. Years ago, in a, a New Year's Day a Tournament of Roses parade, a beautiful float suddenly sputtered and quit. It was out of gas in the Tournament of Roses parade. The whole parade had to stop. Someone had to go and get a gas tank and bring it back to the parade and put gas in the truck to get the uh, 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 float moving so the parade could continue. The amusing thing is the float 
was sponsored by Standard Oil Company. <laughs> With its vast oil resources, the truck was the only truck in the float that ran out of gas. The one float that should have been the positive advertisement for gas became an embarrassment for the company. Ministers and deacons should be the standard of service, not a point of embarrassment. Acts 6 verse 3 again says, Brethren, choose seven men among you. Again, I'm not emphasizing that word seven. Among you who are known to be full of the Spirit and wisdom. And we will turn this responsibility over to them. God, I want to thank you for the ten men that we have in our church that serve now as active deacons. I want to thank you for the good harmony that we have. I want to thank you for... Uh, the spiritual conversations we have and the willingness that we have to help and serve and minister. And Lord, you know our needs in this church, and so, Lord, I pray that you would raise up uh, the men that you would want to be a part of this deacon group uh, so your church would be able to minister in a way that honors you and that your church would expand its influence in this community and even in the world because of the harmony and the ministry that we provide in our church. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.